there's an increased prevalence of not just bacteria, but also fungi and viruses. These microbes have been found at an increased pre prevalence in Alzheimer's patients compared to age-matched controls who died at the, you know, the same age. This episode is brought to you by Bond Charge, formerly known as Blue Blocks. My favorite light and sea pulmonization companies, Blue Blocks, has rebranded themselves as Bond Charge. They're now involved with a huge range of evidence-based products to improve your wellness and life in every way. Their extensive range of premium wellness products helps you to sleep better, perform better, have more energy, recover faster, balance your hormones, and reduce inflammation. My favorites are their red light light bulbs because they can be used to create a melatonin-friendly environment in your bedroom by shining only red and not blue or green light waves that will reduce your sleep quality. After starting to use these red light light bulbs, I find it much easier to fall asleep and feel less awake before bed. If you want to try out these amazing products that are the cornerstones to my most optimal sleep, then head over to bondcharge.com forward slash seamlund and use the code seam15 to save 15%. Michael, welcome back to the show. Hey, Seam. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, like uh, last time we had such a very you know great talk about many aspects of aging and your experiments and a lot of the fundamentals, but uh, we forgot or we didn't have time to talk about your book, uh, which uh, talks about the microbial burden of aging. So like how the micro microbiome and gut health contributes to aging, which I think many people you know haven't really thought about before. It's definitely like a more, let's say, new concept for many people. So yeah, it's uh, very exciting to have you back and uh, talk about what it is and what can people do, you know, to optimize their health and longe longevity. So we can start, you know, what does it mean? Like the microbial burden of aging, that is the title of the book. Yeah, so uh, I should backtrack. The easy definition is uh, the accumulation of microbes and or microbial products in places that they shouldn't be that accumulate during aging. But I should say I didn't start off in the microbiome space. Like my background, my undergrad, my PhD, it, it's not in uh, uh, immunology or uh, microbiology. I didn't start off there. But in my metabolomic studies in people, older and younger adults, I started to see in, in my publications, I started to see gut bacterial metabolites that were associated with muscle mass and function. So back then, the gut muscle axis, the impact of the gut microbiome on muscle mass, muscle function, et cetera, that really wasn't a thing, you know, 2014, 2013. So uh, the why behind it, the why and how could microbes impact muscle uh, or potentially impact muscle. So that got me thinking. And, and, and as I started to dive deeper into the book, then that expanded from not just the gut microbiome on muscle, but gut kidney, gut brain, I mean, gut everything, right? And not just gut, but then the skin microbiome, which changes during aging, the oral microbiome, which some of that is linked with Alzheimer's. So as I dove uh, deeper and deeper, yeah, it just all came together. And it's funny too, the book I published, you know, a couple of times, uh, 2015, up, uploaded a new version, 2016, a couple new versions. So I took a look last night just to refresh my memory and it holds up pretty well, you know, seven years later. So, um, so yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things we can, you know, start with and, you know, the microbiome itself is, yeah, like you said, so vast and there's like microbiome everywhere. Uh, so like what, what is, what are the things that, you know, what is the burden about like what is the thing that accumulate and like what is the negative effect on the longevity you mentioned alzheimer's so like what how does a microbiome contribute to alzheimer's or like other age-related diseases yeah so the there's a few factors that are going on one is uh a worsened gut barrier function during aging so stuff that's in your colonic lumen is supposed to stay there and it's not, or poop it out. It's not supposed to be able to leak into the blood. Now, if some of those things leak into the blood, whether they're microbial DNA or microbes themselves or some of their microbial metabolites, that can trigger an immune activation, immune activation being chronically bad for our systemic health. So that's one way that microbes can adversely affect uh, our health. But in the book, I even took it deeper into, into all of the hallmarks of aging. At the time, there were nine hallmarks of aging. And it's funny because I remember, uh, you know, Aubrey de Grey was talking about at a conference, um, you know, fixing X, Y, and Z as components of aging, and that will, you know, improve health span and all these things. And that was when the hallmarks of aging were only nine of them. And I was like, there's, there's no microbial component. How are you ignoring at least 50% of the story? 
So now I'm sure you know, it's the hallmarks have been updated to include microbial dys dysbiosis. So, um, so that's one way. In terms of um, oral microbiome and Alzheimer's disease, in the brains of people who've had Alzheimer's, it's, um, there's an increased prevalence of not just bacteria, but also fungi and uh, viruses, not in the same study, sometimes in the same study, but in different studies, these microbes have been found at an increased prevalence in Alzheimer's patients compared to age match controls who died at this, you know, the same age. So while it doesn't show causation, this shows that there's something going on there with microbes in the brain and potentially in Alzheimer's patients. So um, where are they coming from? Are they coming from the gut? Some can come from the gut, but others like uh, P. gingivalis can come from the oral microbiome. So um, the good news is these things can be tracked just like we do. They can be tracked. I, uh, I've tested my oral microbiome, I think, I don't know, five or six times, maybe seven, looking for P. gingivalis and other microbes that have been implicated in things like cardiovascular disease and other stuff. Um, and then, you know, finding the tricks to bring them down without killing off the, the quote unquote good ones. Mm. That's a little bit more complicated, but um, yeah, they're everywhere. We're at, we're at least 50% microbial. So uh, just to, to add a little bit more to the story, you know, so many people are talking about all of these human genes, you know, as as potential, you know, so mTOR pathway and AMPK. But the fact is, we're an integrated bio, you know, uh, 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 symbio symbiotic organism, right? So sure, maybe you impact mTOR and bring it down, but what's the impact on the gut microbiome? And is that overall effect net positive, right? So uh, I try to think about everything in that, you know, whole organism context. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, there's so many bacteria inside of us, and some of them are good, some of them are bad. And I guess it's, you know, the balance is still the kind of key, like a balanced microbiome. And, you know, that some you, you do need, like, as I understand, then like, you know, everyone, every one of us has a little bit of this candida, which is a very common, like yeast infection, or, you know, thing that is associated with some negative health effects, but you can't really like, be completely without the candida either so this kind of comes down to like the balance between the good good microbes and uh, the bad microbes so there are things we can do along those lines and um i think some of it goes to understanding just for example like gut physiology right so in the colon which is the portion before you poop poop out you know poop uh it should be acidic so with age the colon actually loses some of its acidity and becomes more basic now when the colon is acidic, that limits the growth of these quote unquote bad ones, just throwing out some names like enterobacteria and further subdividing under enterobacteria would be things like are commonly known of as quote unquote bad ones like E. coli or Klebsiella pneumoniae. So when colonic acidity is uh, uh, goes in the wrong direction in terms of more basic, it can allow for the growth of these potentially pathogenic bacteria to grow and things like E. coli increase during aging in the colon. So, and actually blood stream infections with E. coli also increase in the blood. I think it's in the book I've cited, it was like 10 to 15 fold higher when compared with younger people. So they're coming from somewhere. If they're over, you know, overabundant in the gut, they'll be overabundant in the blood at some point. So, all right. So how do you acidify the colon? And one of the big things that I show in the book is that uh, soluble fiber, high soluble fiber diets, which kind of ties back into our, our first talk, right? Was, uh, uh, high soluble fiber diets, that's converted by um, gut bacteria into these short chain fatty acids. So short chain fat fatty acids are fats. They're fats with, uh, uh, you know, two to six carbon carbons, but they're acids, right? So in very high amounts, they acidify the colon. And um, now there aren't RCTs that prove this, but these are, this is like the accumulation of a variety of in vitro studies and some extrapolation, but in vitro, high levels of the short chain fatty acids bring down levels of these anterior bacteria, which increase during aging. So the problem is, as I'm sure you know, most people don't eat fiber at all, let alone much soluble fiber, just a couple grams a day, if that. So, um, you know, our intestines and immune system can do only so much to hold these, you know, uh, mechanisms in check for so long. And then eventually the dam breaks and it's the slow, you know, the slow march to death. So, that's one thing we can do to optimize gut barrier function is eat more fiber, especially soluble fiber, which is abundant in, in vegetables or non-starchy vegetables. Uh, and that will help. There's an abundance of evidence that the short chain fatty acids improve gut barrier function as one way to prevent these suckers from getting into our blood and activating immune systems. So 
Mm -hmm. um, so that's one way, but there's a variety of ways to do it. That doesn't have to be the only way. Some in the keto crowd come at me and the carnivore crowd and they're like, look at my immune markers now and I don't eat any fiber. So, but for most people, probably fiber is going to be the way. There may be some, you know, extreme situations where uh, other thing has to work because of autoimmune issues or whatever it may be. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's for sure. So like the ketone bodies, butyrate, that can also like re like substitute for the fiber in some ways, if I'm not mistaken, then. So that's an interesting thing because it there is some positive data on uh, uh, hydroxybutyrate and, and ketobutyrate. But can you supplement the, can you, can, which will you make more of? If you have 25 grams of soluble fiber in your diet every day from whole food, uh, how much butyrate will you make? And then can you get an equivalent of that, equivalent amount of that from either a keto diet or butter has butyrate, you know, from these, the, it's it's in limited amounts in foods. It's, a, it's exclu exclusively produced by gut bacteria. So the question is, can you supplement? Can you design a diet without fiber to get high levels of butyrate and other short chain fatty acids to possibly, possibly impact health? I'm not sure. There's very little data on that. But for me, what makes the most sense is uh, is the soluble fiber. I mean, you're you're going to, like I said, you're going to increase the growth of bacteria that degrade the, the fiber, which will make short chain fatty acids. And then that will acidify the colon. So um, mm. yeah. 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 And, you know, you have to also look at the outcome outcome studies, basically like epidemi epidemiology studies, you know, they're still, <laughs> they have their flaws, but uh, if uh, people who eat fiber generally have, you know, better health markers, then uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's still a higher quality of evidence than like Petri dish <laughs> in a lot of ways. Sure. Right. So what you're saying is if the evidence was that eating a very high fiber diet was bad for health overall, you'd expect to see it at least epide epidemiologically. And there's no, I mean, granted, there are some isolated cases. Like I see people who will throw uh, studies like people who have diverticulitis eating a high fiber diet doesn't do anything. And they'll say, see, fiber is useless. Yeah, maybe if you have diverticulitis, but on average, in very large studies, people who eat more fiber, low, you know, lower risk of all cause mortality, kidney disease, et cetera, you know, you go down the list. So, mm, yeah. And, uh, how, you know, I guess these studies, they still control for the healthy user bias, at least to a certain extent, like you can't obviously control it a hundred percent. But uh, because, you know, there is this association that people who eat more fiber generally are healthier, they exercise, they sleep more, they keep a better body composition and those kind of things. But, uh, you know, the studies actually do control for those variables uh, to a large degree. So that's a great point, because it isn't just fiber that can increase the short chain fatty acids. There are a few studies that have shown exercise training in RCTs can increase uh, short chain fatty acids in the gut. So um how that mechanism happens is still being sorted out, you know, but, um, and that actually, if you go back to some cross-sectional studies, athletes have been shown to have higher levels of short chain fatty acids. There are other studies that have shown positive associations between like butyrate and higher VO2 max, which it's either cause or consequence. The training is causing more bacterial uh, butyrate production, or they're, like you said, healthy user bias. Maybe they're just getting more soluble fiber. It could be a little bit of both, or it could just be training. Um, but it, there, there are potentially compensatory mechanisms that don't involve fiber at all. That could be just exercise training, getting a boost in the short chains to maximize gut barrier function. But the caveat to that is it, there may be some U-shaped association there because, um, very extreme, uh, you know, I don't want to say extreme, but, um, ultra marathons and ultra endurance athletes, there is some evidence that, uh, post-race they'll have elevated LPS in blood. For example, LPS being uh, lipopolysaccharide, which is found on the outer membrane of bacteria. It's an exclusive bacterial metabolite. So that it's increased in blood suggests it leaked from the gut or somewhere. And um, so basically, ultra marathoners or ultra endurance athletes, too much exercise, like way beyond the threshold of a physiological regular amount, increased gut barrier leak, and then more LPS in the blood. So, you know, what's that? It goes back to what's that optimal training zone where you get peak short chain fatty acid production, peak gut barrier function, optimized immune defense and all of that. Mm. Gotcha. So yeah, like too much of exercise is obviously still not uh, that beneficial. But uh, what are the like other things that, let's say, break down the gut barrier? So you mentioned the acidity or the low acidity and certain like microbes contribute to that. But like, you know, what is 
with age, you see that the de that declines and people not eating enough the short chain fatty acids or not getting enough of those. So, but uh, yeah, like what is the other things that contribute to that? Ah, uh, so the short chains are the primary things, but there are things like um, intestinal alkaline phosphatase. So alkaline phosphatase is a protein that most people know of in blood, ALP on a standard test, uh, but ALP is also in the intestine, so IAP. So there are data showing that IAP improves gut barrier function. So how can you, and I should say too, IAP overexpression in mice extends lifespan. And then it's been shown, I think, in diabetic patients, overweight diabetic patients, where if you feed them IAP, it improves glycemic status. So it, it's a potentially important protein in the gut. So how can you trigger or increase expression of that protein? And there are other things that can do it besides a fiber and butyrate or butyrate potentially coming from fiber and exercise training, things like vitamin K1, which, but then again, you're going it, to, it's, it's found in green leafy vegetables, but in, uh, in vitro studies, vitamin K1 increases expression of IAP. And then there are other things like vitamin D that can increase it. Um, so there are a few other little tricks that, you know, we can try to, to boost things that can improve gut barrier function outside of exercise training and outside of high soluble fiber diet. Mm. But uh, like things like diabetes or just uh, metabolic syndrome or heart disease or those things, do those uh, accelerate that process, the degradation? Or, or is it the chicken or the egg? Which comes first? Is it poor right. gut area function stuff leaks into the blood? Now you've got microbes in, you know, in the, uh, in the carotid arteries and the intima, and then you get immune activation and the macrophages come and make foam cells. There is some evidence, you know, some hypotheses generated off of finding microbes in plaques, right? So um, I, I probably lean towards microbes are causing some aspect of that. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah. Is there a way to test like their uh, intestinal barrier function or like, is there a way to like measure how degraded it is or how functional it is? Yeah, I, I wish I could say that there were good ways to do that. There are ways that are purported to do it. Like one way is by measuring uh, levels of a protein known as zonulin in blood. This is pretty common, um, but there are some published studies showing that zonulin may not be a marker of gut barrier function, but instead of immune activation, because it, it, it's it been um, mischaracterized as one of the complement proteins, I think C3 or related to that, but still that you would have, uh, so zonulin is found in the tight junctions that are in gut epithelial that connect gut epithelial cells to form some of the barrier so that you would find that in blood suggests a, a leaky uh you know a leaky gut right but um even if that's not what it's actually uh even if that's been mischaracterized as not being a gut barrier uh, uh, protein if it's one of the complement proteins that you have something that's supposed to be in the gut that is immune activation that too is a bad sign but um, there are things like the breath test, like the lac lactulose, and I think uh, sucralose or sucrose, but that's more of a small intestine kind of issue. Mm. Um, the LPS, lipopolysaccharide, is also another way we're finding that in blood, but the assay used to measure LPS isn't great. It, it suffers from a lot of variability, and LPS in the blood can be bound to lipoproteins like LDL, HDL. So mm -hmm. what's circulating in the blood may not actually reflect how much is there. But if you have very high levels of lipoproteins, that could be a sign of having LPS in the blood. Um, also with LPS, um, as I mentioned, alkaline phosphatase, ALP. So ALP has a very important role, not just in the intestine, but if it's in the blood, it dephosphorylates LPS, which can inactivate it, making it easier to get rid of. So I think an indirect way is if your levels of alkaline phosphatase are above around 48, which is lowest all-cause mortality risk in a meta-analysis of like 9 million people, if it's higher than 48, which from my experience, most people are, um, that could be a sign that you've got higher LPS, but still that's very indirect, you know, and speculative. Mm -hmm. So the, the, and then there's another way of uh, lipopolysaccharide binding protein, which circulates in blood. So if, if that's relatively elevated, then potentially you have high LPS and the LPS is coming from somewhere, whether it's mouth, skin, gut. So there are some ways, but, uh, None of them are great, unfortunately. Mm. Are there like any symptoms people experience? Yeah, I mean, it would be what you would expect for an infection, right? You know, malaise, fatigue. Uh, but the, how do you separate that versus like, you know, a viral infection or a fungal infection? You know, I looked into like uh, 
So even studying the blood microbiome, because it can go beyond LPS, it doesn't have to be LPS. So in terms of bacteria, you've got gram negative bacteria, gram positive bacteria, LPS are, uh, are only found in gram negative bacteria. So now you've got a whole other class of bacteria that aren't represented by that measurement. But then even still, you've also got fungi that can leak into the blood and viruses and, and archaea, all kinds of different you know taxonomy that can leak into the blood. So unfortunately, the blood microbiome, even measuring that can be a challenge because there can be contamination from everywhere. Like mm -hmm. in the reagents, reagents used to assay the, the, the thing, on your on the gloves on the tips it can be everywhere so right. even so in terms of the blood microbiome outside of lps you know there have been studies that show associations with cardiovascular disease and diabetes and all of these things um but then there are other studies that show that there's no blood microbiome it's only a transient effect whether it translocates from the mouth like someone doing a dental procedure you can find microbes in the blood after a dental procedure uh so there's other so so it's still being debated on that but there are companies that do whole genome sequencing, which is basically gold standard. Um, but as far as I know, not commercially available. I'd love to have my full blood microbiome sequence where it's everything, you know, bacteria, viruses, um, fungi, and, mm. and seeing how that changes during age and what we can do to minimize that. But the good thing is also indirectly, you'd expect that if you had uh, some amount of microbial DNA or microbes in the blood, that your immune system should be activated. So if you've got, you know, so we can look at things like total white blood cells or even the distribution of neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, which is going to be released in, in reaction to uh, infection or some kind of immune activation by microbes. Uh, so there are ways to kind of get a picture of our microbial burden status. But the tricky part is, and I think this is going to be the 21st century and beyond of, of investigation is. What do you do if you've got intracellular viruses or intracellular infections? Mm. Are they recognized systemically? How would they be recognized systemically? Like I'd imagine your systemic biomarkers could be good in blood, but if you've got an increased burden of cells that are infected by viruses, that the viruses are latent and these cells are somewhat less functional or dysfunctional, how would you how do you detect intracellular? So there is I, to me, I think there's a big uh, you know. Once the science gets to investigating the intracellular infections, which could be some relation to autoimmunity, like why would your, I'm going on a long, long ass rant, but why would, why would our body selectively kill its own cells for no reason? Like there's gotta be some reason, you know? So one reason could be, you know, intracellular infection and the body tries to get rid of it because they're infected with something. Right. So, but the evidence on that is very scant. It's still a very burgeoning field. So, but I, I bet on that going forward in the, in, in the future. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's super interesting. Uh, but yeah, like, you know, like you mentioned that if you have like high neutrophils or high CRP, then it probably reflects that there might be some infection, you know, and because, the, and like we said already, just because there is some microbes like, and like LPS or some other uh, viruses or something, it doesn't necessarily mean they become pathological uh it's there's like you know like the burden is what matters like how big the burden is and how it's going to affect the other biomarkers and stuff like that so if there is something it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to like cause any like adverse effects to your health if that makes sense in the short term i'd agree with that but mm -hmm. how long do you have to have things in your blood or in your cells and tissues that stimulate this immune response yeah. what's the time duration that you need to have that where it now becomes a chronic problem. And if you think about, there's probably going to be, you know, the yin and the yang of systemic health, transient insult, whether it's gut barrier leak, you know, gut barrier leak can even happen after eating a very high fat meal, like that's been published. So now you've got some microbes in the blood or microbial products, immune system activated very transiently, clears it out, system, systemic homeostasis. So I, I'd imagine it's not a perfect system, right? So, you know, even on a Petri dish, if you have some antibiotic and you kill off 99.9 something percent of it, and that 0.0001% survives, they, that bacteria may have antimicrobial anti, anti, uh, resistance or, or anti resistant genes, right? So now it, it proliferates and now you can't kill it with the same antibiotic. You've got to use something else. So I'd imagine that's there's something similar going on where with any transient gut leak, we may not get rid of all of it. And some amount of that can get all over our body. Mm. And over time, systemically accumulates, and then we hit that threshold of we we're we're mostly carrying this you know this 
pathological burden and you know the scales get tipped and now it's that slow march towards death where nothing we can do can really eradicate it so mm, so even like yeah. a single meal single meal could trigger or set the fire to some sort of this microbial cascade <laughs> eventually in, many, in multiple years yeah but most of us get rid of you know whatever transient uh you know um translocation into the into the blood what very quickly and almost all of it but even that small amount that's left you leave that one person alive in the in the village that <laughs> murdered your family and they come back 20 years later and murder all of everybody else right so uh <laughs> Now that's it too. A lot of what I'm saying, there is evidence to support it. I wouldn't say it if it wasn't true, but you know, just the idea that a few microbes can proliferate and and hang out in cells and stay there for decades and cause some aspects of aging, this isn't this isn't a you know a widely accepted thing. This is just my speculation based on the published evidence. Whether that will be borne out in the future, we'll see. Uh, but I, I, I'm I'm not going to wait 50 years for academia to sort it out when there's an abundance of evidence that already leans that way. Like for example, even suggesting that Alzheimer's has a microbial component, um, that's been going on, you know, 10, 20 years. And mm -hmm. there is emerging evidence that comes out year after year that that is the case. But yet you still have people who are going after the non-microbial aspects of it. Like let's get rid of the plaques, you know, let's treat it with this drug that has nothing to do with microbes. Um, and all of these clinical trials are failing because they're probably not addressing the root of the problem, which may have some microbial components. So, um, yeah. Are there like any, you know, let's say you're eating. So are there like any things to minimize the, let's say, leaking into the bloodstream of the microbes? And what are the things that definitely like promote the leaking? So like, are there any, any food groups or any like cooking preparation methods or like uh, whatever kind of other things that cause that? Well, so I, I talked about like that high soluble fiber diet and exercise training and vitamin D, vitamin K. But the other side of that is the Western diet, high mm. fat, high sugar, no, no fiber. In animal studies, this has been shown to in, in part that bacterial dysb dysbiosis that I talked about. So the short chain fatty acid producing bacteria in the gut go down. The short chains in the gut go down, an increase of these enterobacteria like E. coli, um, negatively affecting muscle mass, muscle health. So uh, yeah, the Western diet is abysmal. Um, so, and what's interesting too is that there is evidence that fat cells produce antimicrobial peptides. So mm -hmm. if, if the, not if, but when considering that the Western diet Im impairs gut barrier function, potentially a greater leak of stuff into the blood, immune activation, well, immune function declines during aging and fat mass increases during aging. So that fat fat cells can reduce antimicrobial peptides. It suggests that in some people who may have weakened immune systems, the fat expansion is a potential way to compensate for reduced gut barrier function and reduced immune, immune cell function. So I put that data in the book too, um, especially in terms of the antimicrobial peptides that they produce. Uh, so then I've had people say, well, does that mean I should accept getting fat with age, right? So- I don't know that that's the case either. I mean, ideally, we want to stay lean, keep our immune systems as healthy and functional as possible. Uh, right. And if we see that fat mass start to increase, maybe investigate what's going on with immune immune cell function, right? So, mm. yeah, it's a compensation. If it is a compensation mechanism, then it's, you know, you're, is it like a trade off still? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. But um, you mentioned the Alzheimer's. So, like, how do the uh, microbes affect Alzheimer's risk and what's the connection there? Yeah, so probably the biggest one is P. gingivalis, which is found in the mouth. And I think that's uh, the oral microbiome is probably most people don't don't think about it at all. I mean, even when I go to the dentist and they do a cleaning and whatever else they have to do, and I start ask him, asking them questions, how can I optimize my oral microbiome? I get glossy looks by, these are health professionals who study the mouth as for a living and, and you know operate on it. So um, you know, then the question is, how do you optimize the oral microbiome? And some of that links in, well, actually probably most of it links into, di into diet. Um, so nitrates in the mouth are beneficial and uh, nitrates are things that are, you would be, at least in vegetable containing foods, not in processed meats. You wouldn't want that because they, they don't come with the same beneficial compounds that are in things like uh, beets or uh, greens. But nitrates have been shown to act as basically a prebiotic. I, actually, I shouldn't say it have been shown. This too is in vitro. We're on the cutting edge of, of the science where the, the, the studies in people yet haven't been done. But in vitro, nitrate acts as a prebiotic to basically favor the growth of the quote unquote good ones and reduce the levels of 
things like uh, P. gingivalis and other, others like Tanarella forsythia, fusobacteria that have been found in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. Now, would eating a high nitrate diet, lots of beets, lots of greens, um, which have other health effects outside of the oral microbiome, blood pressure, potentially ergogenic in terms of improving muscle performance and, and, and stuff related to that, um, would that reduce Alzheimer's risk? Again, no data. I have to, you know, keep it fair and keep it honest, you know, but I think it's an easy bet to make. You know, if you add these things or people add these things into their diet, you potentially get that benefit and potentially minimize that risk. Whereas not having it at all, I'd imagine increasing risk. Mm -hmm. Now, taking it even more precise than that, though, um, just anecdotally for me, for example, I eat a very high nitrate diet. I'm eating 200 grams of beets, raw beets every day. And I've measured my oral microbiome, you know, seven times, six, five to seven times. I don't remember off the top of my head. I lost count. Mm -hmm. But I do have bacteria in my mouth that shouldn't be there besides the P. gingivalis. So, you know, that's a more, I think the optimizing the gut is easier just because there's such a wealth of data on studying it. Whereas the oral microbiome and how to optimize that, at least getting rid of potentially pathogenic ones outside of the nitrate story, it's still a very emergent, emergent field. But, um, yeah, there is stuff we can do, right? Optimizing diet, there's definitely stuff we can do. I wouldn't use antiseptic mouthwashes though that have quote unquote antibacterial uh, components because that, that's that been shown to kill off the good one, the quote unquote good ones in the mouth too, hmm. potentially impacting things like blood pressure, like having higher blood pressure in these antiseptic mouthwashes. So if you're killing off the good ones, I'd imagine it could be easier for the, you know, the 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 pathogenic ones to make it easier to get into the brain or the or you know the vasculature, wherever it may be. Mm, yeah yeah so yeah like this carpet bomb is not <laughs> the answer and I, I would imagine the same applies to the gut so like taking antibiotics is probably also not going to be the long-term solution there's but also the skin there's also the skin microbiome which you haven't touched on and, and that too is you know there's so much there's so much on skincare products right that that there's no mention of the gut microbiome or sorry of the skin microbiome at all and probably all of us have a a different skin mi microbiome. What I mean by that is the skin microbiome on the palms is different from the forehead, is different from the soles of the feet or the armpits. So, you know, and even the skin pH in each of these areas, which skin pH plays probably the major role in skin barrier function. And maybe most people don't think skin barrier function is important, mm. but if you've ever seen like your grandma or grandpa with a sore on their face, on their skin, this is some dysbiosis on the skin that the skin tries to compensate you know, uh, by making that scab to try to kill off whatever's there. So, uh, like my, my grandmother would have these sores on her face from, from what, like, so skin barrier function, skin pH is very important, but even most soaps or what's sold as uh, skin cleansers, they don't put their pH values on the, on the bars. Um, so even how to optimize the skin microbiome, that's still an emergent field. Um, and that being said, the skincare industry, not even paying any attention to, all right, this is your skin microbiome. These are the prebiotics you would need to have an optimal skin microbiome to keep it youthful and elastic. We're yeah. on the cutting edge there too. There's almost nobody doing, you know, stuff related to that. Yeah, I would imagine like in a few years or something, there's going to be like this transdermal skin uh, probiotic or something like that <laughs> that is optimized for, you know, the best skin microbiome. But yeah, obviously we don't have anything like that <laughs> at the moment. But it would have to be uh, site specific because, mm. you know, the armpits and the groin and the bottoms of the feet, all different skin pH, uh, different microbiomes, not exactly the same. Um, so Is, do, you, do you want to have like a higher pH or lower on the skin? So skin pH is lower. You want that to be around five and that increases during aging. Mm. So um, if I would use a skincare product, like I would look to see actually what the, you know, the pH pH of it is. And some of that info is in the book for uh, like- You soaps. probably measure it like with the uh, pH strips or- So that's going to be complicated because, you know, the skin is dry, you know- I mean, I mean, I mean the uh, the product, the skincare product. Oh, yep. Yep. But then, you know, how many products do you have to go through? How much money do you have to waste? Right. Yeah. But then the other side of it is how much time do you have to invest to actually go digging for the skin pH, which as I mentioned, almost nobody is- reporting that. So, um, and then there are things we can do. Like, for example, um, I've had skin cancer in the past. I don't know if you guys can see it. I have a scar here. Wow. So uh, that was a, a benign squamous cell uh, carcinoma. So that wasn't a problem. They cut it out. But um, I just went to the skin doctor recently, like two days ago, because I've got some like darker spots on my back. And uh, it's fortunately not melanoma, not even close, but it's, it's, uh, it's hard to say it's seborrheic 
seborrheic ker keratosis. Anyway, what that means is um, it's like a benign tumor, and but it's it's not melanoma, which is the thing that can spread. But the reason I'm raising this point is, all right, so I go to, I ask them, all right, what can I do? And they were like, oh, basically nothing, laser it off, which I'm not fixing the problem. But doing a PubMed search, there are things that, that like uh, very high concentrations of urea. Urea has some antimicrobial effects it's a carrot, car uh, it's a keratinolytic, so it breaks up the keratin. So, you know, I, I bought a 40% urea cream, which is like a bomb of urea. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are things we can do to improve. I haven't used it yet, but I'm going to put it on the spot and see if what's been shown in published studies can impact, you know, mine without the laser treatments. But there are things we can do locally on our skin to optimize skin function, uh, skin health. Mm -hmm. um, but I prefer that targeted, you know, like, yeah. Like you were saying, there are going to be optimal probiotics based on your skin microbiome and, you know, hey, use this paste on your arms because of your microbiome and this is what it'll do. It's only a matter of time. Mm, yeah, well, that's super interesting. But uh, how do you keep the skin barrier intact? So like collagen is obviously important for that. Are there like any other foods or supplements or activities that keep the skin barrier uh, in, intact? Yeah, there, there is some published evidence that links diet to skin health, like carotenoids, higher carotenoid diets being associated with uh, less skin aging. But uh, beyond that, uh, I mean, it still happens. Like I think I mentioned last time, like my skin, if someone looked at my skin, someone actually commented like your, your eyes, the skin, the skin on your eyes is a little droopy. <laughs> so there is skin aging in my carotenoid intake. I mean, 50 milligrams of uh, beta carotene per day, 25 milligrams lutein and zeaxanthin. I mean, this is like 10x higher than most people get. So uh, there, are, but there is a component for diet on that. Um, in terms of other stuff, I think um, it, knowing that, uh, just for an example, so skin pH should be five, right? Now most soaps, so my, my parents would buy like these soaps and stack them up and and like uh, just without putting names on blast, you know. But um, when I looked into what the pH of these soaps were pH eight. All right. So you hear pH eight, you hear pH five, you think, oh, it's not that different. It's a pH of difference of three, but pH is a log scale. Mm. So that's a thousand fold less acidic with the pH of eight. In other words, I'm basically stripping away my pH layer by using these soaps or that I did use these soaps. Um, and, you know, when I use them as a kid, um, I'd feel like, you know, my skin got very dry and I didn't know anything. Of, I didn't know anything of it. So um, outside of diet and, you know, not eating, you know, junk food, which I'd imagine wouldn't be good for skin health. Uh, just, I think a big part of it is knowing which factors can negatively impact it, like skin soaps and cleansers that have pHs way too high, trying to get stuff that's more close to physio physiological pH. So the soaps or skin cleansers that I have now, a pH of five, like I make it a point to, to go for that. And actually my 14 year old, you know, she's into all kinds of healthcare products. And I'm like, you don't even know what you're pu putting on your skin. You don't know any, you know, I'm, I try to get into the biochemistry and physiology of it, which makes her frustrated because she's like, I'm 14. I don't want to think about these things. I'm not a scientist, but looking into the cosmetic products to see what this, what the pH is. And, and yeah, again, knowing that it's in the physiological range, I think that's going to have more of a benefit relative to using these soaps and cleansers that have a pH way too high for skin pH um, mm -hmm. that can potentially strip the layer and you know, uh, impair the, uh, impair the skin microbiome. So, so like if it's, if your skin becomes too dry from using a certain, let's say soap or shower gel or shampoo, then it's too acidic or is it too alkaline? Too alkaline. Um, and, and the skin can, you know, improve its pH, just like, you know, antibiotics, you, you do that. And eventually it can come back. The, the, the gut microbiome can come back to its normal state, but it takes time. So if you're continually stripping off, uh, you know, or, or uh, um, you know, alkalize, alka, alkalinizing your skin from these alkaline soaps, uh, you, it's just a continuous process of dry, 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 dry. And then I'd imagine eventually skin damage, a loss of elasticity. Um, but the collagen story is an interesting one, you know, because it kind of goes into that diet component where, you know, uh, you've got to degrade the collagen and then absorb it and then the component amino acids would have to go to skin where the, they'd be reformulated into, you know, uh, whether it's using the glycine or proline, whatever it may be, that would be good for skin health. You know, that's kind of the long journey to get there, right? So I'd imagine, you know, either topically applied or not applied in the case of the soaps and, and cleansers that have too high of a pH, uh, that would probably be the best bet. Now you always hear um, dermatologists saying, stay out of the sun, but even that is 
you know, that U-shaped curve, because if you stay out of the sun, you minimize vitamin D. Vitamin D is hugely important in, in uh, skin antimicrobial defense. So if you're not in the sun at all, I can't imagine that's going to be good. Yeah. If you're eating vitamin D, it's that same journey where it's got to get into the system and then out to the skin, whereas we evolved to get some amount of sun exposure, you know, pretty regularly. So, mm. yeah. So the, the, the like UV radiation has, I guess, like some antiviral effects as well. Yep. Direct, direct, like on the on the skin. Yeah, but then the other side of that is too much, mm. right? Where you're now photooxidizing and skin aging, and I'm sure you've seen like the pictures of like truck drivers or a truck driver where this side of the face was exposed to the sun, and you can see that you know wrinkles and everything else, and the other side is less aged. So mm. yeah, there. But then what's the U shape, right? So, mm. or the bottom of the U shape. Yeah, I wanted to ask um, about the mouthwash. So like, or, and like the toothpaste, like, so obviously brushing your teeth is still better than not brushing your teeth. So like, are there like any specific, uh, toothbrush, uh, so like toothpaste that are better or like, what do you think about fluoride in the toothpaste and those kind of things? Yeah. So I do have fluoride. So I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of criticism on this, but I do have fluoride in my toothpaste. I'm not swallowing it, you know, now mm. granted, some people could say some amount of that you will swallow, uh, and if I take it out, okay, sure, I'll minimize risk completely. But the other side of that is fluoride helps with mineralization of the teeth, which declines during aging. So do I want to have teeth with an increased risk for maybe cavity formation versus a little bit of it leaking? I, I can see the argument both ways there, right? So um, I think what's optimal for toothpaste is is uh, that too, is the cutting edge and to be explored because uh, it's probably highly individualistic. There are probably things in in the every toothpaste, whether it's the foaming agents or, you know, sodium laurel sulfate, but then the other side of that is using these quote unquote natural products. Uh, do you get as much, you know, is that good for the oral microbiome? There are no studies on these things. Like there are no head to head matchups of toothpaste um, in terms of optimizing oral microbiome status. And then even like looking at Alzheimer's risk, like there's just no studies, you know, um, and how it would be hard to do too, because even if you have a very large epidemiological study, probably most people are using the standard toothpaste that are sold, where very few people are using these quote unquote, more natural versions without the emulsifiers and whatever other additives. So would you have a, a large enough, you know, uh, intervention or, you know, uh, 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 a group compared to these standard toothpaste to see an effect on associations with Alzheimer's disease? So it's hard to say what the optimal is. I've seen, you know, um, some recommending just use no toothpaste and it's, it's just the mechanical action of brushing that can help clear off the plaque. And technically that won't affect your oral microbiome because you're not hitting it with any kind of reagents. I mean, there too, I'd say the only way to know is to test, you know, uh, but then who's really doing that because the oral microbiome test can get expensive and you'd have to do it basically every day to have enough data where you, you know, you do it without the toothpaste, you do it with. So I haven't done those experiments. I, those are experiments I could do, um, you know, cause it, is toothpaste, and it's even crazy to say, is it even beneficial? I mean, I want to have fresh breath. You know, I don't want to have rancid breath, you know, so toothpaste tooth, toothpaste helps, helps with that. But, yeah. you know, it goes to that bigger question of what is optimal. We can get a transiently fresh breath by brushing with the regular toothbrush, but uh, toothpaste, but, you know, what is optimal long-term for the oral microbiome? There's just no data, right? So. Yeah, I mean, the re regular, so like the regular fluoride in the toothpaste, I think I think there are studies showing that yeah, like you only absorb like zero point one milligram if you brush your teeth with the fluoride toothpaste, and like you know the safety amount is still like significantly higher than that. So yeah, unless you're swallowing, then it's very benign in terms of the actual health effects because yeah, like you're not swallowing, you're only like rinsing your teeth with it and you're washing with water out of it as well. And uh, yeah, I should say I have a water filter that. It Fluoride is one of the things it takes out. So I don't want that in my water supply if it is. Uh, so you know, try I try to cover that base, but I hear you on the not swallowing it, right? But kids, little kids swallowing the toothpaste that don't listen to their parents. So mm. um, like mouthwash, I think you have a mouthwash. I've seen a video. <laughs> You're talking about your own uh, proprietary blend of mouthwash. Yeah, I've I've since modified it since then. Uh, it Because the oral microbiome, as I was saying, it's for me right now, harder to optimize relative to the gut. So yeah, I started off with uh, basically a um, physiological saline solution, so sodium bicarbonate in water. And so we want, it, so in contrast with the skin, which we want to be acidic and the gut, which we want to be acidic, 
the mouth pH is uh, close to physiological uh, systemic in terms of the blood, 7.3, 7.4. So you don't want an acidic mouthwash because that's going to accelerate cavity formation, cavity formation accelerating below a pH of 5.5. So it's interesting how all these different niches, mm. gut, skin, mouth, they're not all the same. And actually, that's another important point too, because there are mouthwashes that have a pH that are either below 7.3, 7.4 physiological pH, or you know even higher, which is rare. You want the higher, higher for the right. So sodium bicarbonate it's going to alkali, alkali, alkal. I don't know why it's hard for me to say, but alkalinize the mouth. So mm. I started off with that, and then I had a couple drops of peppermint oil in about a liter. You know that homemade liter of water, sodium bicarbonate, peppermint oil, um, because peppermint oil has been shown to kill off P. gingivalis at least in vitro. So I started with that, and then I've had different interventions where I put xylitol in there. Xylitol can reduce uh, streptococcus mutants, which is a uh, can cause cavities. So I put xylitol in there, but very low amounts, 1%. So one gram in uh, 100, so 10 grams per liter. Um, but then I started take, taking stuff out and not using the mouthwash, seeing how it affected my oral microbiome, uh, putting things in, clove oil, uh, other oils, you know, these essential oils, uh, putting berberine in the mouthwash to try to kill off some of these microbes that are linked with Alzheimer's disease. And, you know, it goes to the, up the point of supplementation and testing. Um, berberine in my mouthwash was a disaster. You know, uh, it sent stuff all over the place, you know, it, looking like dysbiosis and not in a good way. And I put very low concentrations of berberine in there based on published studies, at least in vitro. So my current approach is tongue cleaning, which is the standard tongue cleaning, flossing, water pick, actually I'm using a modified version of that mouthwash now with 10% xylitol mm. only because uh, rel relative to the 1%, it's been shown to kill off um, serratia, mascar, senes, however you say it, however you say it, which for whatever reason in my microbiome or microbiome is either 95% or zero. So I've got this tremendous variability in a microbe that uh, most people don't have and xylitol, very high doses have been shown to kill it off. So the oral microbiome is still a work in progress. You know, it's it's uh, conquer aging or die trying. I've got to figure it out before I'm increasing my risk for whatever serratia can impair systemically. But so far, I don't see any systemic effect uh, of it outside of just my mouth. Hopefully, you know. What, what about like oil pulling or something like that? Yeah, uh, I've done that in the past, but um, I'm thinking about, so there are some oils. I'm thinking about taking coconut oil and mixing it with some of these essential oils that have been shown to kill off the serratia and kind of using that as a quote unquote mouthwash, not necessarily oil pulling. I've used the oil pulling in the past, but I didn't see any differences like on, you know, yellowing. I didn't measure the microbiome, so I really don't know. Mm. Um, but even the oil pulling, you know, which, which fat are you going to use? Are there certain fats that are going to be best for your oral microbiome as a growth, you know, as a full you know, full field, uh, you know, doesn't affect the good ones, kills off the bad ones, you know, should it be coconut oil? Should it be olive oil? You know, these are fatty acid, different fatty acid profiles, saturated versus monounsaturated. It should be a polyunsaturated. Like I've used flaxseed oil in the past as an oil pulling, and that's a polyunsaturated omega-3, uh, you know, so even deciphering that it would take a lot of testing and there just aren't published studies, you know, so it, it, we have to realm into the self-experimentation and needing a lot of data to get to that, you know, but I'm on the case seven tests so far. I'm going to keep at it until I've, you know, got it optimized or I died trying. So how do you test the oral microbiome? Yeah, it's just a saliva sample. And then I send it to a company here in the States okay. and they use whole genome sequ sequencing. So you can get bacteria, fungi. Uh, I haven't seen viruses pop up in there yet, which is good news, but candida levels are low, but uh, yeah, that one bacterium, that's just a, it's either there almost completely. And I thought it was contamination. I communicated with the, you know, the founders of the company and they were like, look, we almost never see this in anybody else. And for whatever reason in your data, it's either incredibly abundant or not there at all. So uh, if it was a contamination issue, I'd imagine everybody in their company or a lot more people would have it. And that's not what they said, but uh, I'm not sure if it's a global thing. You know, uh, there are global companies yet outside of the United States and I, maybe they ship outside of the United States. I, I don't know, but uh Whole genome, whole genome sequencing is the way to go. I think uh, you're not just getting bacteria, you're getting potentially fungi and whatever else may be there. Uh, so, Gotcha. What do you think about these probiotic and fermented foods? So like sauerkraut and pickles and other like, do they have any positive effect on the microbiome and aging or what do you think? Yeah, so so there's a couple things going on there. One is whenever someone, whenever I, someone hears or whenever most people hear about optimizing the gut microbiome, 
they say, oh, I eat fermented X, Y, and Z. Um, but the fact is, you know, it, if people are eating fermented foods, that's great. There is some evidence that fermented foods can improve things like uh, gut bacterial diversity. So you have uh, a larger group and more differences for the total bacteria that are there. It's not just a group and very little diversity. You have a lot of different stuff. So, but even bacterial diversity in the gut can follow U-shape where too little is bad, but also too high, which is found in kidney disease patients. So uh, there, and then other, other, uh, you know, people will, um, there are some studies that have compared like uh, inulin, for example, which is found in garlic and onions. So very high inulin based diets and compared that against like uh, um, fermented foods or even probiotics. And then the probiotics or fermented foods will come out on top, you know, in those studies, like the Sonnenberg lab has, has published some of those studies at Stanford. But the fact is to get like 30 grams of inulin or onions, I mean, this is almost impossible. It's a completely, it's like giving a mega bomb of drug. You'd have to eat pounds upon pounds, kilos of, of onions, which there's no way physiologically we didn't evolve to do that. So are there head-to-head -head studies of probiotics and fermented foods versus a high soluble fiber diet? I haven't seen that yet. Now, in terms of evolutionarily, there probably were, and again, this goes on to that, that, that ledge of here's all the published evidence, and now I'm starting to speculate what could be true or not, right? This is just my speculation. Evolutionarily, we did have fermented foods in the diet, right? If we didn't eat for three days and we came across an apple tree and there were a few apples or maybe most of the apples on the floor that were half rotted and fermenting, we probably ate them, right? So there is probably a role for fermented foods in the, in the human diet, but as the majority of our intake, there's just no way. And I, I'd imagine that eating you know, pounds of fermented foods probably isn't gonna be good uh, for human health. So in small amounts, I'd imagine gonna be beneficial, whether it's through probiotics that are in the foods themselves or uh, some of the fermentation products, whether it's lactate or whatever. So I think fermented foods are our component. It's just a matter of how much. Now, the other aspect of it is too, is uh, I see people saying, uh, I supplement with X, Y, and Z probiotics, so my gut health is good. But even that is the suboptimal approach. But what I mean by that is I think the best approach is to actually uh, study one's gut microbiome and to see which ones of the quote unquote good ones are potentially missing and which ones of the potential bad ones, quote unquote, are elevated. And then coming up with the strategy to, you know, optimize that towards, you know, youth and not dysbiosis. So how do you do that? Right. So in one study, uh, one research group, the Bindles group, just using as an example, they had mice in a cancer, uh, a cancer mouse model. Uh, um, so cachexia where they lose muscle mass and then controls uh, with, that were not, that didn't have leukemia. And they looked at the gut microbiome in both of those animal models. And they found that the, the leukemia animal model had lower levels of lactobacillus, which is found you know, in dairy and other stuff. So, and it was dramatically lower. So they thought, all right, what'll, what'll happen if we restore levels of lactobacillus in the cancer mouse model? So they gave it as a probiotic and when they did, they saw muscle mass increase. Uh, so, you know, I, I favor, you know, the, um, you know, just like I do with all the systemic biomarkers that we talked about, you know, it's track, identify demonstrated need, come, with, come up with the mechanism and potential hypothesis for what can be used to optimize that biomarker and then treat it like that, as opposed to the published studies show X, Y, and Z and other people. And I'm just going to take it based on hope that it's going to do that for me. So the same for the gut microbiome, like, identify potential weaknesses in your gut microbiome, Ident identify potential probiotics that you could take that could impact that or the dietary approach that could impact that. Mm -hmm. And then do the experiment. Uh, just as another example, I've taken probiotics in the past using that approach, like the phytobacteria, which decline during aging. And they cause some kind of GI issue where um, like blood in the stool, like uh, it shouldn't be there, it, which never happens otherwise. Uh, so trying to restore levels of a bacterium that don't exist in my microbiome, whether it was antibiotics as a kid or whatever, but um, it's not always easier said than done. And then also just the, the long, long winded uh, story, um, some pro probiotics aren't coated in capsules properly to survive the acidity of the stomach. So maybe they make it to the colon and they're just dead. Now, can a dead microbiome, uh, dead bacterium have positive effects systemically? There is some evidence for that, like pasteurizing Acromancia does have health effects, um, but you want it to be alive and you want it to be able to survive in your gut and be able to bloom, whereas it can't do that if it's dead, right? It's it's just there, so, or you poop it out. So a lot of factors involved with the probiotic story. Yeah, and you know most of the 
probiotic supplements they're just you know random strains and random species that you know you don't necessarily know even if you need or if you have too much of it already or if it's yeah not suitable for your microbiome so yeah the first is probably to do like a microbiome test um, and to see like what are if there is some like imbalances or dysbiosis uh, in there and then like supplement if needed the other side of this too is you, you mentioned ai and you know ai crunching the numbers for this targeted probiotic to skin there's mm. got to be a way where we evolve society evolves towards that too for so you for the gut microbiome too when what i mean is you'll have an, a pre-existing gut microbiome composition and that composition they're making you know uh proteins they're making metabolites so it, it's not just who's there just looking at composition we'd also need to know what they're doing so having all of that information in in uh, some kind of neural net or learning out al machine learning algorithm. And then, you know, the AI would be able to predict which probiotics should be able to improve your overall profile to make it a really a targeted approach. Um, you, and even which ones could survive there, you know, but even then, and then which prebiotics you would need in your diet to help keep them alive in that ecosystem. Because if you have a dominant strain, you know, the, the giant redwood tree in the forest, and, you know, there's a trillion of them, and you, and you just, you know, you supplement with 1 billion, which is a thousand fold less, is that 1 billion going to make a dent in that forest and that ecosystem relative to the trillion others that, that exist there? That's kind of the probiotic story. And then if you take too many, have you, have you altered the balance of it toward? So yeah, eventually we'll get towards, you know, we'll get towards that more uh, personalized, but definitely not, not there yet. Mm. Yeah, I guess I feel like it's very hard to like manually try to i don't know like create the perfect microbiome like i feel like the microbiome is almost like the outcome of the kind of perfect lifestyle or <laughs> like a perfect diet and stuff like that it's very hard to like reverse engineer or manually try to yeah create that ecosystem like that ecosystem is the kind of outcome of um, a perfect fit for your genetics and environment with your lifestyle and diet kind of. It, yeah. And so that's a great point because then it goes to the issue of if you don't pay the most attention to optimizing your gut microbiome, would you see that reflected systemically, right? So that goes back into the idea of biomarkers because I could add a probiotic or I could add X, Y, and Z to try to optimize the gut microbiome. But if I don't see systemic things or at least circulating things improving systemically, what have I really done? You know, I'm just expensive supplements and I'm not positively impacting change. So that goes back to looking at the systemic biomarkers um, through any intervention, even the gut microbiome um, as a potential output, You know, whether it's the neutrophils and inflammation or circulating levels of alkaline phosphatase. Um, and then do you see changes in that as a result of optimizing or attempting to optimize your gut microbiome? Mm. Um, a little bit of a backtrack, but like, what do you think about glutamine for the gut barrier? So like that's a common kind of this intestinal permeability supplement. What do you yeah, think about that? There is some evidence that it can in, improve the type barrier, you know, the gut barrier function. But uh, the, the only way, yeah, I, I mean, that's just a gross generalization, right? I think I think the best way is going to be through, you know, the lifestyle, whether it's through the high soluble fiber diet, whether it's through exercise training, um, I think that's going to be the best way. Now we're taking glutamine on its own outside of those things, kind of band-aid the approach. Um, would it be better or equivalent? I, that's, I don't know. You, and there's probably some individuality where maybe some people could supplement with it and, and then look at some systemic biomarkers. And if they see improvement, then it's working for them. Uh, but I'd say testing is, is the essential part there. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there are things like, for example, just on a side note, uh, you know, I've been taking niacin and tryptophan trying to target NAD related pathways because my NAD levels are low. So if I didn't test and I didn't measure, um, if I only measured NAD and I doubled my NAD, I would think, oh, I'm good now. I, I'm, you know, I'm out of the old range and I'm good, but <laughs> my Dunedin pace and the only thing that was different, you know, how, how carefully I track my diet, my Dunedin pace is my worst ever with niacin and tryptophan together. And I took the niacin out. But I doubled the tryptophan, not knowing that epigenetic data for that July test for my August test. And I'm imagining my donated pace may be even worse with doubling the tryptophan. So it just goes back to this idea of uh, glutamine may work in other studies, may work theoretically on you know gut barrier function. 
Uh, but you've actually got to look at some measure of systemic biomarkers, whether it's, do you see lower inflammation? Do you see lower immune cells? These could kind of signal that you've actually improved gut barrier function. If people are just taking it based on hope, it may be worse physiologically that, than, than they expect. So anyway, the Danita pace is probably good news for you. I'm not going to catch you yet. I'm going to have to play some more catch up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and like another thing I wanted to ask was the apple cider vinegar. So that's acidic and uh, can help with like digestion in some ways. So like, how does that, what do you think about that? Yeah. So you know what the major, fat, the almost exclusive fatty acid that's found in apple cider vinegar, vinegar mm. acetic, acetic acid. Yeah. It, yeah. Which is C2, two carbons. It's a short chain fatty acid produced by the gut microbiome, produced by exercise training. So um, now then that gets to a, do a, a, a dose response. And there are a couple factors there too. Um, when you're drinking it, it should be absorbed through the small intestine. Very little of it should make it to the colon, right? If if the, the amount that you're drinking gets to the colon, then you've got some absorption issues through the small intestine because it's a food, right? So um, now then considering that the gut microbiome makes acetate and make, you know, which is acetic acid, um, does having the gut microbiome making acetate in the colon downstream of the small intestine, do you need those effects there in terms of gut barrier function to optimize systemic immunity and systemic health, you know, lowering glycemia, all the things that soluble high soluble fiber diets have been shown to do in part through the short chain fatty acids? Or can you get some of that benefit without the colon and you just now have a transient increase in circulating, circulating level, levels of acetate because of apple cider vinegar? There's probably a little bit truth to both. I'd imagine you do get some positive health benefit with the apple cider vinegar through the small intestine and eating it, but probably maximum effects are going to be having it also in the colon. Um, mm, okay. But then it then it becomes a dose response too, because how much, you know, can you go too high? There is some published evidence that um, people who are obese have very high levels of short chain fatty acids, uh, both in stool and circulating. So again, that U-shaped curve, you know, if you're just having too much apple cider vinegar, have you have you bypassed right the 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 lowest part of the U? So, mm. whereas on a high fiber on a high soluble fiber diet, I imagine it's hard to overshoot. Yeah, yeah, and if you like drink it directly, it might be too harmful for the teeth uh, as well. So you know. Yep, that too. Careful. True. Uh, speaking of that, like coffee and tea, so like you know, coffee more like about how does it affect the oral microbiome if it's too acidic or. Yeah, I, I haven't seen any data on that. Mm. Um, on the flip side, though, green tea, there are a, a good amount of studies that have used green tea as a mouthwash mm. for, uh, you know, optimizing oral microbiome. Uh, but there too, you can get, you get staining, right? So you you lose the cos the cosmetic effect as a negative, but maybe it optimizes and reduces. And I actually used it for a while and stopped when I saw my dentist, they were like, you've got some extra yellowing, you know, as a, as, as a and I was like, yeah, I've been using green tea as a mouthwash. So I stopped that too. Um, I don't know that I would use coffee as a mouthwash. I haven't seen any of those published studies, but, um, but then too, it, there is published evidence on coffee epidemiologically, you know, where, uh, it's associated with reduced all cause mortality risk. So you'd imagine if it did have a negative impact on the oral microbiome, it isn't reflected in all cause mortality. And rather than focusing on the isolated part systemically, the net effect would be positive. Right. So, um, yeah, I guess the, yeah, you know, the, with the microbiome and oral microbiome and th things that, you know, the final outcome is still the mortality that most people want <laughs> or yeah. what most people want to focus on. And yeah, you can, you can start to like micromanage it a bit uh, too much eventually. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But uh, is there anything else you want to cover that we didn't talk about something important? Yeah, I think we got it all gut, skin, mouth, um, probiotics fiber, exercise. Um, yeah. It, so th I think that's, that's the interesting story is for the people who don't eat any fiber that can have good, good gut barrier function, or whether it's, they've got the genetics to better maintain gut barrier function without any fiber. Uh, anecdotally, I know that there are stories where that exists. So I think that's hugely interesting. You know, um, what are these alternative pathways? Is it, you know, an incre increase in ketosis? And then you've got hydroxyburate that acts as, you know, part of the improving gut barrier function. Do you get enough, you know, beta hydroxybutyrate or, or ketobutyrate to optimize gut barrier function? 
to me, that's a huge, that's a huge thing. An interesting story, you know, cause I, I don't want people to think I'm a dietary absolutist and I'm definitely not a vegan. Right. So, you know, um, it's for the, for, for the people that, that aren't on those high fiber diets, that it doesn't work for them for whatever reason, bloating and, you know, just don't like the foods and are on other diets, you know, um, what is their, what do their systemic biomarkers look like of gut translocation? You know, do they have low white blood cells and, and low inflammation? So that, that to me is the, the cutting edge part of the cutting edge too, is, is sorting out those details. Um, mm. Yeah. I guess you have to just keep track of her symptoms and uh, the biomarkers to see which one is, you know, working for you and which, which diet is the best. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. All right. Uh, where can people get the book? Ah, so it's on uh, Amazon, uh, Kindle, relatively cheap. Um, and then, yeah, people can find me all over the internet. Just type in my name all over the interwebs. Sounds good. We'll put the link in the description. And uh, yeah, it was great talking with you again. Cool. Thanks, team. Same. All right. I'll see you around. But do you want to slow down aging and live longer? If yes, then I'm looking for more people who want to reverse their biological clock. If you're interested, then email me the word health to info at seamland.com and I'll send you the details.